Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Tonight, our panel is the Conservative International Development Secretary, Justin Greening, Labour's Chuko Muna, who returned to the back benches rather than serve in Corbyn's shadow cabinet, the Green Party's first appointment to the House of Lords, Jenny Jones, the Mail on Sunday columnist, Peter Hitchens, and the writer, broadcaster, and professional poker player, Victoria Corrin Mitchell. And as ever, if, if you want to join in the debate and the argument that goes on here tonight, you can text or tweet our hashtag BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time. Text comments to 83981. Push the red button to see what others are saying. Let's have our first question from Zaid Ahmed, please. Would you support junior doctors if they decide to go on strike? Would you support junior doctors if they decide to go on strike? Justin Greening. Well, I think... Um... What needs to happen is people need to get around the table and talk through to getting a, a proper solution to this junior doctor's um, contract change. What we're trying to do is make sure that the NHS can work seven days a week and really provide outstanding services at the same time. We also know that many junior doctors are completely overworked at the weekend and in fact there are some that work over 91 hours a week. So these two things go hand in hand. Um, three years ago, the government started negotiating with the BMA. Clearly, um, we've not reached a conclusion with them yet. Jeremy Hunt put a new revised offer on the table yesterday. And I, I think what we all need now is for people to perhaps set aside the discussions and the arguments that they've had up until now and just get round the table and, and work through these, di these differences. Because in the end, would I think... You, would you oppose them if they, if they decided to strike? Would, you, would the government say that's not right, you shouldn't? Or would they say, well... You, we've, we've done our best, you've, had your, you've got an absolute right to go on strike. I mean, I've talked to junior doctors in my constituency and I understand their frustrations. I just think in the end, they're hugely committed to the NHS and I think the best thing that we can all do is actually get round the table and talk right. and find a resolution that means they don't feel they need to do that anymore. Victoria. Now, as I understand it, it's rather difficult, though, for them to get round the table and negotiate, because haven't they been told by Jeremy Hunt that if they don't basically agree all the proposals, it'll be imposed on them? So, I think they're allowed to quibble with one thing out of 23. How can they sit down and negotiate? They're being too threatened. <laughs> the question, I mean, I would. I'd support them if they went on strike, because not just the issue of... Obviously, the immediate medical question, do you really want to be treated by somebody who's working a 91-hour week? I mean, that's sort of... When you try and do the maths of how many hours that is a day, it's sort of terrible. There's a bigger question as well, though, which is, I believe the idea is to define overtime as after 10pm mm. and Sundays. And I think most of us are worried in the age of mobile phones and the internet. I think we probably all worry, where does work finish and life begin, don't we? we when is our home time? And if the government, whether it's about doctors or anything else, if the government is ready to define home time as after 10 p.m. and Sundays, I think our way of life generally is going to be sunk. And, you know, the, the French go on strike if, if their lunch hour is cut down to four hours from the, the normal five. So I think if doctors are going to be in the vanguard of saying, no, I'm sorry, you know, if, if you're not at home by eight o'clock and on a full weekend, you're in overtime, if they're going to defend that, uh, good luck to them. Um, I'm a junior doctor um, and I've been balloted for strike action today and thank you Victoria for bringing up something that not many people are aware of. So the government is quite ready to say that the BMA won't come back to the table. What a lot of people do not realise is that the BMA is unable to come back to the table until we agree to 22 non-negotiable preconditions. In my view, that is not a negotiation. Mm. <laughs> Peter Hitchens, and then you can come back. Peter Hitchens. I, I don't think doctors should ever go on strike. I, I just don't think it's something they should do. 
Uh, I th it's, it's one of those things where you, you, you have to say this is a job which requires you to be available at all times. And I, I doesn't mean I don't sympathize with the case. It just means I think that the strike weapon is not one you can use. I, the other thing which seems to me to be very noticeable is that the doctors have completely ceased to trust Mr. Hunt. And there doesn't really seem to be any real communication between them. I very much hope... Uh, that the government finds some way of reaching a settlement which doesn't involve the doctor's strike for the sake of all the patients who will suffer as a result of that, because they will. These, I remember as an industrial reporter, any pledge one ever had from any group that the, the, the public would not suffer from any withdrawal of emergency, emergency service was never actually fulfilled. It always does hurt people. So I think that it should be avoided, but I think it may have to be avoided by Mr Hunt departing and being replaced by somebody better able to negotiate. Yeah, just, just yeah, finish your point. What, what are these other... You, you say you're only able to negotiate one point? Yes, which there's is one point. I can't remember off the top of my head which point right. exactly it was, okay. but there were 22 non-negotiable points. What I wanted to say was that we have... 50,000 junior doctors whistleblowing. Jeremy Hunt says he endorses whistleblowing in the NHS. We are standing up and saying this contract is unsafe, it's going to be fatal for the NHS, and he will not listen to these okay. 50,000 whistleblowers. And, and you, you're up there, Mr. Um, I also agree that, obviously, if they do go on strike, it, it's not a, not a good idea, but I think that it actually shows how bad the situation is, that these people who know how important their jobs are think that the only option is to go on strike because they're obviously not being heard and issues aren't being sorted out. So they believe that strike is the only option and I think that just shows how bad it really is. OK, and you, sir, in the second row. Is a strike really the best way to get the public on side anyway? Because when the tube drivers did it, it didn't really win me their support when I had a three-hour journey home from work. Mm. And you so you, you think that it's not... Uh, they would be wrong to strike? Not necessarily wrong, but it's not going to win me... win their support. Ch Chukwumuna, what do you think? Well, I mean, I agree with um, what the lady just said. I mean, uh, which lady? Uh, the, the, the last, yeah, uh, the okay. last contributor. I, I don't support a strike action, but I'm certain because it, it's going to disrupt the services provided to my constituents. But I'm certainly not going to condemn uh, the doctors uh, for doing it. And really, what this is emblematic of the cack-handed approach this government has adopted in relation to our NHS generally. Dr. Sarah Willis. <laughs> Dr Sarah Williston is the Conservative Chair of the Health Select Committee in the House of Commons. She's herself a former GP and she has criticised the Health Secretary for basically negotiating in the media uh, with the doctors without properly negotiating with them direct. Is what he's proposing wrong, apart from the way he's negotiating? My I mean, biggest... Well, uh, my... Uh, 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 Peter says that his, his way of negotiating is pretty hopeless, but what about the issue of... My, Increasing well, the pay by 11%? Well, well my, my biggest concern, and the junior doctor, I, I think, I, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry, just touched on it, is I, listening to the junior doctors I have in my constituency and also seeing uh, some of the reports. Pay, look, the pay, actually, I don't think is necessarily the biggest thing here for many of the junior doctors concerned. You don't become a doctor because you want to make money. You become a doctor because you want to care for people and save lives. But the issue here is that one of the things they're going to be doing is taking away the financial penalty which applies to hospitals where they overwork junior doctors. And this obviously acts as a deterrent and prevents uh, our junior doctors becoming so overworked, so over and so exhausted that that impacts on the treatment that we're getting. That is a big concern. I think the second thing is, is in the recent survey, I think 70% of junior doctors are saying that if Jeremy Hunt does what he is threatening to do, which is impose what is currently on the table on junior doctors, 70% of them say they will go abroad. And I'm also worried because of the changes which have been made to the um, rotoring for weekends and evenings and how you get paid, that you're actually going to find it's very hard to find junior doctors prepared to do that. But as I said, right. this comes on top of a wasted three billion pound reorganisation of the NHS we okay. promised we wouldn't get, rising waiting lists, and it's been completely, it's been handled in a completely cack-handed manner. It's disgraceful. Okay. You, sir. Are we not taking a very short-term view here where we try and save a bit of money and then end up driving incredibly skilled well-trained young professionals that want to dedicate their lives to working in the NHS and drive them away because the morale within staff that work in the NHS is being depleted day after day, not only by politicians that say that it's about money, which it completely isn't, um, but also mm. with just being overworked and drained 
and that is a pathway to destroying the NHS. Right. Jenny, I'll come to you in a moment, but Dustin, can, can you answer his point? Two things. First of all, this isn't actually about money. It's not about saving money, and actually um, junior doctors will be, for the first time, actually having a cap on the amount of hours they can work so that they don't have to work unsafe levels of hours as they do now. And in fact, if you go on the NHS Employers website, there's actually a pay calculator there where you can go and check directly if you're a junior doctor how this new contract's going to affect you. And actually, overwhelmingly, doctors, junior doctors will be doing better. And they certainly won't be doing Do worse. better in terms of the money or the time, the hours they work? Well, we'll be capping the hours. At the moment, there's around 500 junior doctors who routinely end up breaching So can, can you hours. guarantee, Justine, therefore, that after the contract comes into effect, on the whole, junior doctors will be working less hours than at the moment? Yes, in the sense that at the, moment, at, the moment, at the moment, junior doctors, in some cases, are working over 91 hours a week. That's not good for them, and it's not good because for the Because they're NHS. forced to, because they choose to. Well, partly because of the way the system currently works. And, that, and one of the problems around that is how the junior doctor's contract works. But I'd like to just come back to the point um, that the lady in, in the, over there was making, which is I think actually we do need to get back round the table and, and work our way through this. In the end, um, we can have a debate on question time, but what's really going to fix this is the BMA getting back round the table uh, with Jeremy Hunt. And I hope that over the coming days... That can happen, and that, you think uh, that, that negotiation can move right this ridiculous gun to the head of the 25 non-negotiable points well, in order for them to negotiate. That. The BMA will get round back round the table as soon right. as Jeremy Hunt removes the conditions. Hold on, Jenny, okay. Jenny, let's hear from Jenny Jones. I want to come back to you afterwards to see what you made of what Justine said. Jenny Jones. This 11% pay rise sounds very good until you look at the conditions and then you understand actually that to get a decent salary junior doctors are probably going to have to work even more hours and that is definitely unsafe. There's also the fact of course that junior doctors are probably nearly at the end of their tether, they are exhausted and uh, that, I mean they could easily decide to go abroad, that means all of our investment in their training, in their education has gone and it's wasted so this actually is a very false move. We all know the NHS is understaffed, underfunded, underloved, undervalued, and it's time that this government, instead of trying to break it down piecemeal and sell it off, actually understood it's a real, real social asset and should be supported. And, and yes, I will support the strike, would support the strike if it happens. Um, it was a really eloquent defence of doctors and the difficult situation they're in. Uh, from you, Chuka. But at the end of the day, how can you, as a supposedly Labour MP, when the doctors are in this position, when they're not being negotiated with, when they're out of options, not support their right as a body of workers to strike? Your I party was built on unions. I support their right to strike, and I'm not condemning them for going on strike. But equally, I represent 100,000 people, and I want to make sure that they can benefit from the services that they need to be healthy. Um, and ultimately, I owe my ultimate duty to the constituents that I represent. All right, I'll take one more point, then we'll go on to another question. Uh, one in the second row from the back there. I've got two points. Uh, first of all, um, I work in a hospital setting and I work with doctors. And the other day I was just really struck by one of the doctors who was already on shift and she said, oh, just another 12 hours to go. And you could see that that was a struggle for her. And she said, the way to cope is caffeine and chocolate and yeah like I said I was just really struck by that and the second point I just wanted to make or ask was if not strike what's the alternative talk what's well this is the key thing you see I'm afraid this is just a lot of hot air and it is true what the chap said your exact words were I wouldn't support the strike but I wouldn't blame them for doing it we just can't have this from politicians. I love everyone. Everyone's right. No one's wrong. Well, Victoria, so Victoria, on the fence. Victoria. <laughs> Victoria, it's, it's very easy for you to say that, but I represent people who often will be in need of very serious treatment. And if I was to support strike action, which was to hinder the treatment that they were getting, that would be the wrong thing to do, in my view. It's not easy and it for might, me to say that. Well, it is easy for you to say. No, it, it isn't. And it I good need and it'll get, doctors. It'll, I've it'll got get, a baby. It, I want doctors to be available. But the chap that said, 
does, it's not does, going to do anything. No, it won't get a clap. The chap there who said it's quite understandable that striking is not the way to get public sympathy. Yeah. It never is. It's always the double bind that workers are trapped in. Transport workers, doctors, they want the same thing as we do, safety, but how to go about getting it. Their means of getting it will alienate people. It won't get support, but they're stuck. No one will listen. Right. Uh, but what is the alternative? There is no alternative. They need to strike. OK. <laughs> well, We'll go on, we'll go on. I want to get through some questions. But uh, just before we get to the next one, uh, Stoke-on-Trent next week, Belfast the week after that, if you want to make a note of it. Stoke-on-Trent next week, Belfast the week after it. The uh, details are there on the screen, and I'll give them at the end. But let's have a question from Gary Wilson, please. Following the suspected bombing of a Russian aeroplane in Egypt this week, is it time to take full military action against IS? Peter Hitchens. Uh, no. Uh, first of all, it's suspected and not proven and we shouldn't rush to do things of this kind. Secondly, the idea that taking military action against Islamic State is going to reduce the terrorist risk is an absurdity. Uh, it, the, the military action which this country and the United States in particular have taken in the Middle East and the other interventions which you've undertaken in the Arab world over the past 10 or 15 years, and indeed in Afghanistan, have increased the risk to us repeatedly. We have no idea what we're doing in these places. We destroyed the stability of Iraq and replaced it with the chaos out of which IS grew. Uh, we've destabilized Syria and turned millions of, of, of reasonably contented people into corpses and refugees. Uh, we wrecked Libya and turned that into a failed state with our brilliant intervention there. What is it that makes us think still, after all these stupid, unforgivable failures of incompetence and, uh, and, and ignorance that we are going by another military intervention suddenly to make it all right. It really is time that as a country we realise that we have... <laughs> two well, um, Justin Greening, the defen your Defence Secretary, Michael Fallon, said today it was morally indefensible Britain was relying on other countries to bomb Islamic State targets. Uh, the French didn't agonise over it, he said, but it's morally indefensible for us uh, just to stand back. What's your view? Well, first of all, ISIL is a threat to the UK. We've seen that, and we need to take steps to deal with it. At the moment, we're part of the coalition action against ISIL in Iraq, but of course ISIL's also in Syria, and we're not able to be part of taking action against them. So we've got half a strategy, which is why what we want to do is build a consensus so that we can win a vote in Parliament to actually have a proper strategy that means we can also play our role in trying to tackle ISIL in Syria. And in the meantime, of course, the other thing we need to see is for the Russians to actually be part of that coalition tackling ISIL rather than doing what they're doing at the moment, which is actually bombing the Free Syrian Army and the Syrian moderate opposition is going to be part of Syria's future, so they shouldn't be taking action against well, it. Can, 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 can I just say? challenge yeah. that? The, the, this constant uh, chorus from the government about these moderates in Syria. The moderates in Syria are exactly the same people who they urge us to be on guard against in schools and everywhere else in Britain. They're not moderates. Uh, they are, they are, they are, they are, they're utterly and completely dedicated to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the extremist Islamic cause. And we propose to back them because actually British foreign policy is not made in London anymore. It's made in Saudi Arabia. And our, 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 our attitude towards all, all right, these things is, 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 is governed okay. by our desire to please Saudi Arabia. And all right, no, no just, other sense. All right, Peter, ju ju P uh, Justin, just reply to that, and then I'll come to you in the second row. Thank you. Um, I actually met the leader of the Syrian moderate opposition in Parliament yesterday. He wasn't the kind of person that you've just talked about. These are people who are standing up against a brutal Assad regime that's barrel bombing ordinary civilians in Syria. They talked to me about how there are half a million Syrians now who are totally cut off from any help that can be provided to them. And they need the rest of the world to provide assistance and also to help them tackle ISIL too so that in the end of this, when we do reach a political settlement, there's a Syria there for them to build a future again in. How can you how can right, you right, how, no, how, I'm sorry, no, how, how can you claim to be right, how can you claim to be against the supposed come, tyr tyranny of Assad when this week your Prime Minister has welcomed uh, the leader of Egypt who recently killed hundreds of his own people and runs a regime 
on, on the, on, on, as, as, if not as repressive as Assad, similarly repressive. Right, How can you claim you. to be principal, principal in, the, in, in this matter? You're right. You're, you're not. Let it's me just say, I'm fed up with all these wars in these countries. They need to come to an end. And let me say to you, Chica, that Tony Blair was responsible for the Iraq war. He needs to be in jail. And let me say this. Jenny Jones, your own leader, told this nation that she said, oh, if you are part of ISIS, you're not a risk to this country. Let me say this. They are a risk to this country, and if they ever go to another country, they should never be allowed back in this country again. It's a moral that they are. All right. Well, uh, Chukwu Muna, perhaps you'd start on that, and then Jenny Jones, I'll come to you. Well, I mean, I didn't support the uh, action in Iraq. Um, that happened under the last uh, Labour government. I was opposed to it. But I think taking a step back, there are instances when the international community should have intervened and acted, but sat on its hands like in Bosnia-Herzegovina and also Rwanda, where I think looking back with hindsight, we would have preferred that the international community acted. So I think to take a view that all uh, kind of military intervention and action is necessarily a negative thing and cannot save lives and cannot make a positive impact is wrong. I don't have anything in principle, I don't have any principle objection to military intervention if the questioner was meaning whether or not there should be a military intervention in Syria going beyond Iraq. But I think the key question is whether it can save lives and whether it can make a positive difference. And uh, for me, I mean, the things that I'm most concerned about, what is the legal basis for the intervention? I think on the whole you would want a UN uh, resolution. Is there support amongst the international community for intervention, particularly the powers in that area, Turkey, Qatar, others in the region? What are the military objectives and are they achievable? What is importantly learning the lessons from Iraq, the plan um, for after? And once we have been given the information to make a judgment on that, then you can judge whether military intervention on the part of the UK would actually make a difference. Now, so far, I mean, Justine talks about what the government would like to do, what it wouldn't like to do. It hasn't actually put a proposal to the House of Commons to consider yet. And I think it's at that point that we can actually make a judgment as to what to do. But floating ideas and trying to put feelers out in the media or talking to members <coughs> of Parliament, formally put forward some proposals, and then we can consider whether it's the right thing, not just in our national security interest, but whether actually it can make a positive difference. So that's a proper way to do it, in my view. Jenny Jones. Bombing anywhere you want is to answer never... His an... point? Is, is never an answer. Um, the fact is, the US has been bombing Syria for 14 months and the situation has not improved and if anything it's got much, much worse. I want to pick up on something Peter said. He said that um, uh, we have de we've de destabilised the Middle East and the big problem I have at the moment is that we are not taking responsibility for what we have done. I was in Calais last Friday and met some of the 6,000 refugees, many of them from Syria but all from war zones. And these are people who don't want to be there. They don't even really want to be in Britain. What they want to be is back home safe. They want to be free from threats of beheading and crucifixion and rape. And the fact is, they are there because we have been bombing at various so times. What action, would you, what action, if any, would you think... I think the we next, or other countries should take? I think Justin was absolutely right. The next step is, is that all the countries involved have to sit down and find some sort of diplomatic means. They have to start talking. They've got to stop bombing. The idea that, that you know, the US and Russia are now bombing the, the same country is horrendous. There, there could easily be clashes. So we have to sit down. I'm not a patient person, and uh, you know, it, it's difficult for me to say we have to sit down and talk, but quite honestly, bombing has not worked. Do you think you could... You, you start there. I'll come to you. Noting that ISIS, uh, isn't it worth noting that ISIS was able to grow because of our intervention and because of our uh, destabilising of the region? So surely, if we intervene again, it's just going to give rise to something even worse. Exactly. And the woman behind you. I think what has filled the nation and people around the world is the unilateral or bilateral interventions of these countries, and not being, you know, working as a unit like they did with Nazis. They were able to conquer Nazis when they came together. So, as a body. But everyone going into these different countries unilaterally, Britain went into Iraq, uh, America went into Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, individual countries would never be able to conquer this. So unless they come together as a body, they're going to create more problems. And, and you? Um, I want to 
have to say that ISIL is a new phenomenon, not only because the Iraqi intervention, uh, the Western intervention, but now we have ISIL in Libya, we have ISIL in Egypt, Turkey. where previously we didn't have any. And that's because the West is not supporting the tra transition to democracy in the Middle East. Um, the Gulf countries and the West have, as Peter said, Sisi was here this week, and this man has killed thousands of people, and he's been received with great honors in the UK. And uh, can you imagine that what, you know, there's a risk of a bomb on a plane on the Russian jet after actually having a, such a security breach having happened. And he's presenting himself as the man of stability. He's the one who's going to beat ISIL in Libya and ISIL in Sinai. And I think that that's absolutely, it's not only military. You don't have to bomb people in, in, in the Middle East to stop ISIL. You've got to stop people turning to ISIL as a solution <laughs> for violence. We want the ballot box back, and because the UK is welcoming a man who threw our votes into the rubbish bin uh, in Egypt, um, then, then this, is, this is a very bad sign for the region, and I think something sh sh the opposite should have been done. He should never have been welcomed here. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't, have a, I don't have a sophisticated response to this. I, I think it's, it's... People find themselves in a terrible position. On the one hand, you, you, the stakes seem so high. Is it, as you say, like sitting back, whether it's Bosnia-Herzegovina, whether it's like you know, Germany invading Czechoslovakia? Is it sitting back and not helping when we could help and letting people die? That's awful. Or is it bombing and causing mass death and more instability? That's awful. And I sort of, I feel like 20 years ago, we rather innocently imagined that the people that took the decisions knew something we didn't and were going to do something competent. And what happened with Iraq was... Even if they had a secret evil agenda to take control of the region, they failed even in that. And it was so incompetent that I think it's terribly frightening to think the same sort of people are making the same sort of decisions again. And either way, a terrible mistake can be made. And this is not a helpful binary answer to the question, but I hope it's a reasonable summary of how most people feel. Yes. I think the, the problem with ISIL as a, a whole is the fact that we don't actually understand it. We need to, you know, to, to get more intelligence. And I think the only way that will be achieved is through bilateral cooperation. Um, if that's between ourselves and the US or, you know, people like Saudi Arabia, I think the best thing to do is attack this at its roots and then go from there as opposed to jumping in with preemptive strikes, which are going to ultimately cost millions of lives. One thing I would like to say, sorry, yes. having not been sure on that, one thing I would like to say is be, be very careful of the idea we need more intelligence. One thing I do know, Beware the politicians. It's quite convenient for the government that the possibility that uh, IS is behind this airstrike comes in the very week they're asking for greater powers of surveillance. Yeah. They want to read more of our yeah. emails and phone calls. Beware the search yeah. for more intelligence because uh, there's other factors at stake that we may not okay. quite understand. Yeah. You sit up there and then we'll go on to another one. Yes. I think Pierre and Pierre Hitchens is talking absolute nonsense in terms of Syria. By not intervening, we would like to turn to a bloody mess, and people have turned to extremism because of that. No, in it was fact, our, if you look at the, no, if let you him finish the point. If you look because at the I facts, you will clearly see that ISIS grew because of the chaos that enveloped Syria. No, we, that's why we're dealing with it now. The chaos that enveloped Syria was was caused by external destabilisation, yeah. uh, which, 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 which came, which came, which came, which came out of the Gulf and was supported by the United States and by Britain and by France. Uh, in this curious belief that the, the Syrian regime, horrible though it undoubtedly is, uh, was in some way, as we claim, worse than anywhere, anyone else in the Middle East. In fact, that, that, that's simply not true. Barrel bombs are talked about. Nouri al-Maliki, our friend in Iraq, has used barrel bombs in Fallujah. There's hardly a Middle Eastern state, Bahrain, in which we've just opened a naval base, uh, uses torture and hideous repression against its people. Uh, and we have no principled objection to that. The idea that our objection to Syria is its tyranny is simply not true. And the other thing about this is the intransigence of the Syrian opposition, backed by us and the United States and by the Gulf, refusing to, to go to any negotiations in which, the, in which Assad did not go, has prevented any kind 
of attempts at a diplomatic solution now for years. And all the people who've been driven from their homes and killed and maimed during that time can turn to those who said, we will not negotiate unless Assad goes and say, why couldn't you make a compromise? Were our lives and our homes so unimportant to you by comparison to that, that you were prepared to demand that right, Peter, forever and you. ever? Jen that's, what, that's what's been going right. on. That's Jen the reason for it. Jenny Jones, briefly. Intransigence. Jenny Jones, very briefly, I I've, want to go on to another I've place. worked and visited Syria many, many times times and the fact is that it was an incredibly stable country considering it was a vile dictatorship and so on it was actually a very safe stable country people were repressed but actually they got on with their lives um, there was a lot of employment uh, food was cheap it was a good place to live and believe me our bombing has made it the, one of the worst places on earth to live okay Sean, 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 Sean Wigan please your question Sean Wigan um, how do we house the high number of immigrants arriving, considering the shortage of council houses available for existing UK residents? How do we house? We had a lot of questions about housing uh, here in Tottenham tonight. How do we house the high number of immigrants arriving, considering the shortage of council houses available to UK residents? Chukarmuna. Well, I think two things. First of all, it's not just uh, homes uh, for rent. It's obviously homes that people want to buy, but ultimately we've got to build more homes if we're to deal both with the situation of an inflated housing market but also high rents. One of the problems we've got in the area that I represent, particularly in an urban centre like London, I represent uh, one of the constituencies in Lambeth, is that we simply do not have enough space to build more homes. And one of the challenges that our council is facing, it wants to increase the number of homes, is the only place it can actually build them is on existing council estates. But ultimately, we've got to invest in that. We've also got to sort out the planning rules. But in the rented sector, as we see the private rented market increase uh, as a share of the tenure that we have here in London, um, we've got a Wild West situation where, frankly, people are being ripped off by many landlords, are facing exorbitant rent increases and there isn't proper regulation in the market, which is why one of the things we were proposing to do in the lead into the general election was to cap the amount of rent increase that people were facing, but also stop these agents charging these extortionate fees every time you're moving home. So far, we've seen no action from the government to do anything about this, when actually I see you know, many constituents who, for them, never mind they're not being paid enough in their work, but housing costs are taking up most of their income. But, Sean, is your question about immigration as well as about housing? No, it's more in regards to um, housing, more than immigration. Um, probably more in line, because I work um, for the criminal justice system in a probation hostel, and um, over a number of years, it's quite difficult for residents moving on to obtain housing. Um, and I'm just wondering if it's so difficult for the existing um, UK residents to get council properties, how are we then housing the immigrants coming over? Okay, you, you in the front row. Yeah, the point, I actually used to live in rented accommodation in London for a few years and I've actually just moved to the East Village in Stratford, which is the old Olympic accommodation. Now that's um, owned by a housing association, it's got cap rent on inflation and the difference I saw there, which will be negligible 1.5% increase, is against a 10% increase in my last place in Clapham with no any uh, improvements made at all, that's got to be the solution. It's the only solution. OK. And you? Um, I work as a nurse in Islington, and the amount of patients that we have to see that need housing sorted out through the council and the amount of time that takes up. So I spend probably 30% of my week in the council trying to sort out housing. Look, but then it, you know, affects their mental health problems as well. And it's just the whole system needs to be sorted out. It does, and one of the problems is we should be building around 50,000 new homes, at least 50,000 new homes a year here in London, and yet under the current mayor, we've seen build of around 20,000 new homes. Um, and unless you build more, you invest more, and also address some of the planning constraints, we are not going to be able to get a grip on this. Right, Victoria. It's, it's a knock-on effect, because then what happens is, like, we know how strained the NHS is, and yeah. as a nurse, I'm having to spend my week in the council, because there's problems with the council, so less patients get seen by me, there's less treatment being done, because I'm spending 30% of my week in the council. So it, it's a knock-on effect. OK, you sit up there, uh, on, the, on the right. I've got to be honest with you, you could asparish your crocodile tears because it was uh, you alongside the Tories that 
that sold off those council houses, that drove those people back into the, you know, the hands of those unethical uh, landlords okay. that you, know, you've, you, know, you, you seem to be crying for. You know, if it wasn't for you uh, carrying out Tory policies that drove those people into the, uh, into the hands of those landlords, we wouldn't have this crisis well, I'm right sorry, now. I'm, I'm sorry, right, that, that, that's all garbage. Right, that's all right, that's all right. Right, so I think for me there's, it's really important that young people growing up in London do feel like they've got the chance to get on the property ladder and that means doing three, <laughs> it, means, it means doing, it means doing three things. One is getting on with building more homes and actually over the last few years we have seen more council homes built, we've seen more affordable homes built. No, 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 well. no, sorry. Well, it, no. The idea of let, young let people... Me, if, I can just, if I can just finish. Okay. So, so part of this is building more homes, including starter homes, which will be at 80% of the market value. Alongside that, then, it's helping young people be able to get the deposit that they need to be able to buy those homes as well, which is where help to buy is making a big difference in reducing the amount of deposits that people need and the last thing though is. is around many of the housing estates that are all in our local communities which I think over the coming years have a real chance to be regenerated providing better and new housing stock for existing residents but also giving us the chance to create more homes and more housing for new people growing up in communities but today, but there are why, no, why there are the no easy... But house building, there are house no building is at its lowest, right. according to the government's First own figures, since the 1920s. 1920s. We built six, yeah. We've built 600,000... However many you built, it's lower than it was in 1920, the lowest since 1920. We've built 600,000 new homes since 2010, and actually housing starts in the past How 12 months... Years is that? Since 2010? Housing starts in the past 12 months... Sorry, housing planning that's been given permission in the last 12 months is over 250,000 units. So there are homes being built, but I think we're dealing with quite a long-term generational lack of homes that are being built, especially in London, and it's taking time to get that turned around. But it is being turned around, which is why more affordable homes are being built, more council homes are being built. <coughs> OK, well, and I think you'll we be... Are seeing the number of people who want to challenge you, so maybe you could hear from them. The person up there in the second row from the back. You in blue. Hi, I used to uh, live in Lambeth, actually opposite your uh, surgery chucker. Um, I'm having to move out of London. I earn a decent wage. I'm a Londoner, but I can't afford the rent. And you say there's no room to build more houses. But if you get the bus around Lambeth, Wandsworth, there's plenty of room to build luxury apartments, yeah. luxury flats. I can't afford them. I don't think you can afford them. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah, you're saying, you're quoting figures, 50,000 targets, 20,000 houses being built, but like it was just said, what percentage of those houses are affordable? All these figures, mm. 20,000, are they all affordable housing or percentage of that is luxury housing? And the man next to you. Right. Uh, Chuka can talk about the um, number of houses being built, but when Labour were in power, they only built 13,000 houses. No, there were more houses built in the one. last year mm. when Margaret Thatcher was in power. Council houses. Mm, that's right. That's, at, that's right. I'm sorry, that, that, is just, uh, that is not a figure I recognise. Before the crash, we you were building around... How does before, before the crash, we were building around 240,000 new homes a year across, across the UK. Now, in terms of the council houses, to pick up on um, my former constituent, um, I'm sorry, to be, I'm sorry to, be li to, to be losing you. Yeah, <laughs> um, we're sorry. We're, so, we're sorry to to have um, lost you. But of course, the problem is going to your point about the space issue. It's space that Lambeth actually owns. If they were to go, they just simply don't have the money given the cuts they sustain. Fifty percent of their budget going to buy up all the private land that you're talking about. So that leaves them with their land to build on, and they don't have enough of it. Do you agree we should cap rent so like they do in Berlin? I'm very sympathetic to rent. Uh, exercising that control which is why you know having a cap on the increase that people are subject to by their landlords every year was something that i was elected on that was a manifesto that i was elected are you in favor of controlled rents i'm very sympathetic to it sympathetic I think. doesn't mean yes anything to yes you. yes you are in favor yes i am you are in favor I you'd am. vote for it i would vote for capping okay. rent corbyn yeah. would be with you on that one i think so <laughs> yeah victoria I, first of all, it needs to be said that the idea that any young person, really, unless they're the child of a Russian oligarch, could live in London anymore, is preposterous. <laughs> it's not... 
Tottenham, which is, you know, not central London. In fact, it's one of the poorest places in Europe. In Tottenham, a one-bedroom flat can cost you £400,000. It's a stupid amount of money. 80% of it is a stupid amount of money. No one can afford to live here. And, of course, they could build more houses. I don't know how many council houses were built in London in the last year. Probably about 40. I mean, a ridiculous it's amount. It's there needs to be a proper revolution. And I know it's, you would say it's easy for me to say because I'm not a politician, but I'm not, and it is, so I will. <laughs> I think what has to happen is all of the young people and all of the workforce just have to leave London. They've got to just make themselves work somewhere else. The government has to find something to offer people outside London to regenerate other parts of the country, and they'll leave. And all these super wealthy people with their iceberg houses will be left with no nurses and no policemen and no firemen and no one to clean the houses and no one to deliver the mail to the houses. <laughs> Again. Okay. The last thing I want to say, which is also very important, is be very careful, though, about talking about immigration. It's not about immigration. This isn't a population problem. It's only very recently that London has returned to the population level of 1945. It's not the number of people. It's the cost of the houses and the type that are being built. All right. You said the front. I'll come to you, then. Yes. Uh, I actually work in the London property market, and uh, I've got two quick points to make. I mean, the, uh, the help to buy scheme is a complete failure as in order to qualify to buy one of these properties, you need to be on 70, 80, 90,000 pounds at least. So that's one point. The second point, I've seen rents go up by at least 15 to 20% in the last two years, and wages are not coming up to that level. And that's simply a, a supply and demand issue. And you talk about building these houses, but where are they? Where are they being built? Jenny Jones. I've got so much to say on this that I'm going to fall like, trip over myself. But basically what's happening here in London, the, um, the, the driving out of people, it's not just the cleaners and the baristas and people like that who, who are on low pay who are getting driven out. It's academics, it's junior doctors. It's all sorts of people that we need to keep our city going. And there are all sorts of things we could do, but we, in general, are choosing not to do. Um, I've been watching Boris Johnson for the past seven and a half years, fairly up close and personal, and he, when he came in, redefined affordable housing. It's all very well talking about building affordable housing. We all agree on that. But actually, affordable has to be affordable for everybody. It's not affordable if you, owe, if you earn £80,000 and you can't buy it if you earn any less. That's not affordable. He redefined affordable. We should think about rent caps. Of course we should. We've tried things like landlord registers because, of course, um, a, a lot of people, you know, if, if you're in rented accommodation, you complain about your boiler, you get kicked out because it's such a, a bad market for, for people who are trying to rent. Um, we should also be bringing empty properties back into use. There's something called the land value tax, which is too complicated to go into, but that basically penalises you for leaving a building empty for any length of time. There's also... Um, there's also, for example, um, social housing. We should be building social housing. I grew up in a, um, a, a council house in Brighton just after the war. It was brilliant. My parents were on really low income, a hospital chef and a, and a dinner lady. That Nowadays, they would never have access to that sort of... Well, it's harder and harder for people like that, families like that, to have access to social housing. So many councils are building, so well, they're starting to build social housing, but what they're doing, of course, is they're selling off some of the, build, some of the flats to, um, to offshore investors and people who see it as an investment. It, housing is for people who live in the city. It is not something to make right. huge yeah. amounts of money out of. Thank you. OK. Thank you. P Peter Hitchens. Yeah, First of all, it's quite plain that our housing policy in this country has been a catastrophe for many years, and the, the, one of the things which has made it so was the, the sale of council houses, which everybody still says was wonderful, which I think we must recognise was a disaster. Uh, destroyed a huge amount of rented housing stock, incredibly valuable to people who had to work and needed to move to, move to work, and replaced it with the absolute catastrophe of housing benefit which currently costs more than the Royal Air Force uh, to maintain and is an immensely expensive way of, of, of trying to house people. We've also repeatedly had governments which have sought to cover up their failure uh, to create a productive economy uh, by, by pumping up housing bubbles to try and sustain the economic figures and make themselves look good, during which time we have accumulated a national debt of £1.5 trillion. £1.5 trillion, completely unpayable. And this constant use of housing bubbles and of pumping money into housing to, uh, to, to, to try and save themselves from serious economic decisions 
has been one of the causes of the Are you saying there's a motive not to build houses? Well, there's a motive. Well, the, 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 the housing policy is not directed by any desire to build houses. The housing policy is directed to cover up for the fact that they failed to manage the economy of the country over, over several decades. But the, the, the final point, and Victoria, although a lot of what you said about housing in London was extremely sensible, and for, for Justin Green to sit there and imagine that young people can, can buy property in London, this is the best government that hedge funds could buy. And they obviously <laughs> spend time with nobody else but hedge fund managers if they think that any young people can afford houses. But the, 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 the problem that we also face is that how can a country uh, which has such a major problem in housing, how can it conceivably have, have a policy of undiscriminating, non-selective mass immigration at the same time? Uh, is this not guaranteed to cause greater problems than you already have? To say that the number of people make no difference is, Victoria, absurd. No, I didn't say the number of people make no difference. You said it, you said I said it, was it would be wrong to imagine that the population of London is too big because it's immigrants, well, when I, it's only the I, same as it was in the I, I, I'm not, I don't live in London, I, and I, I recognise the existence of other parts of the country, but there is absolutely no doubt, and the, 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 the recent projections show that our population is rising towards 70 million at an astonishing rate. There is absolutely no doubt that there are a lot more people in oh, this country well, than there used to be, and a great, deal, a a great deal of them the, are the result of uncontrolled mass immigration, which we will not control. <laughs> and which, until we leave the European Union, we can't control. Well, would you agree, then? Let me just ask you this question. One important question. If you think one should be controlling the population where it's getting too big, and the main reason if the population is too big is because it's ageing, so people are living longer, how do we control that? Should we get rid of the old folk as well? Well, if you, if you have, as I say, a, a, a set of, of existing circumstances, of which that may be one, it doesn't seem to me which have caused a major housing crisis and problems for almost anybody seeking to, to, to buy a house. It doesn't seem to me to be sensible to bring in a very large number of, of, of people who haven't got houses to live in no. at the same time. Okay. Isn't that elementary? Is, is, is we, don't, no, we, don't, we don't have a housing crisis because oh, of immigrants. No. We, don't, we have a housing crisis because we haven't built enough homes. All right, I'm going to, I, we've got ten minutes more and I want to get a couple more questions, or at least one more if I can. Uh, before, we, before we come to the end of the programme. James Barton's question, please, next. Are cuts to the police force endangering the public? Cuts to the police force, are they endangering the public? The Met here in London believes it faces cuts of up to a billion over the next five years. Jenny Jones, I think you, you're in a pos position to answer this because you're on the London Assembly Police Committee, but you're also defined, I think I've got this right, as a domestic extremist by the Met. Yes. Is that right? So well, you're, re you're running the police who define you as a danger, I, Yes, I was tagged as a domestic extremist by the Met Police. Uh, for ten, I was on their database for ten years. Now they've told me I've been taken off, but I've actually reapplied for my file to find out if, if they actually have taken me off. I d I've been a critic for the of the police for a long, long time, but even I think that these cuts do okay. are starting to endanger the public. The fact is, they were so fast, so savage, by a Tory government. Who'd have thought a Tory government would slash at the police funding like that? Nobody doubts there was fat to trim from, the, from all the police budgets, but it's gone too far. They were done so quickly, the cuts, that the police themselves had no time to be strategic about the cuts. They had to sort of slash and burn, and that's no way to run any sort of police force. And does it endanger the public? The question. I think it does. I think it does. The, the real problem for the Met Police in particular is, of course, that they have a lot of other functions, mm -hmm. international and, um, and domestic, but that other police forces don't have. And the government repeatedly doesn't pay them for it. Uh, the Assange, for example, keeping him trapped in the embassy for, for, for all those years, £12 million. Pounds, Met hasn't seen a penny of it. At least I hope that's still true. But perhaps they will tomorrow. Now I've mentioned it. All right. You, sir, in the middle there. Oh, yeah, it just goes sort of hand in hand with um, kind of, I don't know, Tories just making stuff up. I mean, the manifestos that I heard of in this election just gone and, and the, you know, the election in 2010 with the coalition said that there will be more patrolling generally in areas and there definitely isn't. I mean, my area generally, I mean, if, I, if I'm lucky, if I call the police for, for anything and, and they actually turn up like three hours later, I need to like look around, walk around a bit and then move off again. So cuts are just a joke, aren't they? Yeah, and you, sir, in the white shirt there. Um, thank you. Uh, Justine, I would just like to know, the Tories have always had a very good relationship with the police, so why are you making these cuts now? If you look at crime across the board, actually, in London, it's, it's fallen dramatically over the last few years. And at the same time, victims who... people who have been victims of crime are saying that they're more satisfied, actually, with how they're being dealt with, with the police. At the same time as that, we also need to make sure that we deliver on making sure our public finances are affordable for the public, and that includes making sure that 
the policing we have is on a sustainable footing in terms of how much money is going into it. So we're trying to make these different objectives match up. I think we are getting there. Um, but we've been elected to try and get the rest of that deficit that we inherited uh, dealt with. It doesn't do us any good to hand over a whole load of debts to the next generation. We're getting on with doing that. We've got the spending review in November, which will set out how we're going to make the next set of savings uh, in terms of public finances. But I meet up with my borough commander regularly in Wandsworth, and, and actually they do work very hard to look at how they can run themselves more effectively, more efficiently. And I think it's wrong to say that the changes in funding just suddenly being put onto the Met Police. They are challenging, they are difficult, but actually people are working to make sure how we can make sure that policing in London is able to continue to be as successful in the future as it's been in the past, but at the same time, it's done in a way that has a sustainable level of funding that's going to be affordable. You I'm sorry. You I'm say, sorry. Hang on. You say that, uh, you say that it's... Uh, the crime is falling, but the, but the figures for London on knife crime show a big knife rise, crime don't they? Knife crime is up. 18% up. increase. If you, if you look at crime, violent crime, including on uh, transport, for example, you've seen year-on-year -year reductions. So Justine. the reality is crime, crime overall has fallen. We want to see those Justine. trends continue. Knife but at the same time, we've got to make sure that our police is funded in a sustainable way. Knife crime is up 14%. Serious youth violence is up 8%. Youth gang offences are up 23% Is this because in of London. cuts to the police? Well, I asked this question. I sit on the Home Affairs Select Committee. We took evidence from a number of chief constables, and I asked them the specific question that the question has just asked. Will the public, will you be able to keep the public safe in the way that you have up to now after these cuts? and they doubted their ability to do that, particularly the Chief Constable of Lancashire. And there are two specific issues that I have. We in London are facing losing more than 5,000 officers. At the moment, there are proposals to lose all of our police community support officers. We have a particular problem in my borough, next to Justine's, of serious youth violence. Neighbourhood policing is absolutely fundamental to preventing this gang culture capturing our young people. Are you talking about the money, are you talking about the money that's provided or about the way the police use the money? With the two different Both, because I asked the Met Commissioner, the Deputy Met Commissioner who we had in front of us, I said, how important is neighbourhood policing and will you be able to carry on the prevention work around gangs with the level of cuts sustained? Will that not be more difficult? And he said that's going to be very challenging. The other big issue that we're looking at in my borough is we've had quite a lot of... The, we've got historic child abuse investigations. Of course, it's not historic for the people who um, are the victims and survivors of that. But the money that is going into that is being taken out of the general pot. There isn't even a specific sum of money for this very serious issue that has particularly come to the fore over the last two to three years. And actually, if you look at the Met, of the 30,000 referrals that are expected mm. from um, uh, Justice Goddard's inquiry into ch historic child abuse, half of those are going to be in London, and they're not provided so, with so any you, extra resources sorry, so to so do just, just briefly, I'll come to you, sir, in the front. Just yeah. briefly, you wouldn't make any cuts in the pricing of Well, we believe you, make, would spend you could make up to 10% cuts. Oh, you, are, well, you would make cuts. But they, All right, fine, I just want to make But, the but they're cutting. The original Met budget is yeah. going to be a third less than what it All was right. after these you, cuts. You, we do not believe that the police can sustain that. A, a contributive factor to <clears throat> our problems with the police is mismanagement of what we can afford. It is too top heavy. You've got chief constables, deputy chief, chief constable, assistant chief constable, <laughs> deputy assistant chief constable. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making this up, it's a fact. But, It's, it's a fact. It's a fact. You got that. After that, you got chief superintendents. Then you got superintendents. Then you got chief inspectors. Then you got inspectors before you get to sergeants. And then, and 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 then, look at the salary of our own commissioner in London here, four hundred thousand pounds a year. And I'm not talking about the extras. And then compare that salary with that of the constable, twenty-eight thousand. <coughs> All right, Peter Hitch, thank you very much. I get the point. I think we get the point, and we like the it's, list. It's, Peter a good, it's a good point, but at some years ago, I, I got tired of listening to the police complaining about how they couldn't do what they were supposed to do because they didn't have enough numbers. Uh, the truth is there are, th that for some years, there have been far more police officers in this country, both per head of the population and in, and, and in, in 
total uh, than there were in the 60s when we had much more effective policing than we do now. The reason for the problem is that the police do the, the wrong 60s thing. They're very nice, they're very, they're very nice people. Um, they're very nice people, but they do the wrong thing all the time. If, uh, if you are burgled, or if you are robbed, or if you are mugged, uh, the police cannot unburgle you, or unmug you, or, 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 or unrob you. Nothing. They, they, are the cops they, in no, danger no, in the public, no, Peter? Is the question. No, no, I, we I know, only what, have a short I know time what, left. what the question is, but if yeah, you well, just have you cliche politicians, no, let politi politicians run on, but let anybody who has anything original to say shut up. No, no Peter, I that, won't absolutely. shut up. Absolutely. I will I, not shut up about it because it is, it is so important. <laughs> the police are supposed, and they were invented in this country by Robert Peel, to do one thing to patrol on foot the streets to prevent crime and disorder. That is something they no longer do. If they will start doing that again, we should pay them a king's ransom, all the money we've got. But at the moment, they won't do it. They vanish from the streets. Uh, they, they only turn up after things have happened. And quite frankly, that creates a demand that can but, never conceivably okay. be I'll fulfilled. Be very, I have big, the big solution to this problem. It's, it's very, very simple. Uh, like uh, most people in London or, or, or any big city, I don't see a policeman from one month to the next, but I can't move for traffic wardens. These, uh, uh, they can patrol the streets, don't worry about that. And that's because uh, the, uh, imposing uh, uh, parking uh, uh, crimes is a massively profitable business. The traffic wardens are all being gradually replaced by cameras, which means greater income, lower outlay, spend the same money on policemen. All right. I'm, I'm going to do, uh, uh, I'm going to take one, one last question round the table in the light of something that happened this week from Tim Paramore, please. Is the government turning our schools into joyless exam factories? Just very briefly, joyless exam factories. This is the news that seven-year-olds, according to the Secretary of State for Education, are now going to be tested uh, to see how they're doing. Uh, Justin Greening, but briefly, please. Parche, no. Peter. No, we're not, but what we do want to do is make sure that we have a good sense of where children have got to as they pass through schools so that they're not all dealt with the same and actually across the board we can start to get a better sense of how well children, individual children, are progressing right. through school and how well schools are doing at bringing them on and helping them to steadily be in a position to reach their own potential. Joyless exam factories. Jenny Jones, do you agree? Absolutely, yes. I mean, childhood should be a time when you learn to enjoy learning. It should be full of joy and excitement and pleasure and actually finding out about the world around you. So the idea of constantly testing and assessing and putting stress on seven-year-olds, why would we do that to our children? All right, Peter Hitchens. The, it, 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 is, it is true that this is what they are, and it's because it, rather than doing what needs to be done to the schools, that is to say, bringing back proper rigorous education in the basics and, and selection in secondary schools on, on academic merit, uh, they insist on constantly reaching for gimmicks and on driving the schools and punishing the schools with incessant Stalinist five-year plans and exhortation. That's the only policy they have because they will not, for ideological reasons, do the only thing which would make the schools better. Victoria Curran, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, yes, absolutely, joyless exam, but not just that, joyless exam factories all day, and then hours of homework at night. They can't even come home and play. It's absolutely awful, and it's, it's pertinent to me because uh, I've decided, as a result of this, that uh, our daughter will not go to school at all because it's too miserable. She'll be homeschooled. My husband, unfortunately, thinks that means she'll turn out weird. So uh, <laughs> the debate she'll continues. she learn to play poker at an early age. I think that's the only way. The, the woman in the, front, in the very front here, and then come to you, Chuka. Yes, just, just briefly. I just wanted to ask where you saw the education system in five years' time. Given... Uh, I think that might take quite a long time to answer, <laughs> so maybe, uh, if you'll excuse me, we won't do that, but Chuka, very briefly, I joyless that... exam factories, or are you in favour of testing at seven? No, I think there is a problem with turning them to joyless exam factories, and look, the, re the, the problems with our schools are not because our kids aren't doing enough exams and tests. We need more teachers. We've got loads of kids in overcrowded classrooms at the moment, and that should actually be the focus, I think, as opposed yeah, to continually... That there's a massive che yes. teaching recruitment Retention. crisis, exactly as that lady says. We've got record yes. numbers, well. record numbers of teachers are leaving the profession. And I think that's what the government work. should be focused on, not okay. incessantly testing our young people. Well, I wish this debate could go on, but it can't because we only get our hour.